Welcome everyone to today's conversation, four keys to motivate follow through. And those of you that are coaches and do coaching will recognize a lot of this. That's okay. As you've shared, it's a good review and hopefully good refresher, good insight for those who are unfamiliar with that. Uh, the agenda or the content for the information. First off, here's what we're going to talk about. Motivating follow through is actually easy when you recognize personal preferences in the moment and then adjust effectively to them. On a similar note, with powerful questioning, specific focus, people will engage fully and then they are empowered to create their plan for implementing change. Of course, when they create it, as we know, that's the true power because then they own it and follow through on it. Our learning outcomes for the conversation. We want to recognize personal differences and then select how to am, interact with people with intention. Use powerful questions to stimulate client awareness. Differentiate what the client is moving toward and ask them to define their action steps so that you're empowering their ownership of it. That sets up the agenda exactly. Uh, we're gonna recognize different personal styles and adjust. We'll talk about powerful questioning, focusing forward, exploring internal motivation and being proactive, and then empowering people for ownership. So as a starting point to the conversation, a few insights, perspectives here. When you think about people, People think, feel, and prioritize differently. Our own personality influences how we think, feel, and prioritize. So what does that tell us? Respect is really based on learning about and understanding the individual. Many of you are familiar with the golden rule. And I know there's a couple of versions of it. The golden rule I'm talking about is the one that says, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Well, in light of the reality that everybody's different, we don't necessarily want to be treated the same way. Dr. Tony Alessandra coined the platinum rule, treat other people the way they want to be treated. So, hi, Anella, how you doing? Is that you with a question? Okay. I will keep going. Maybe that was just a glitch. In terms of recognizing personal style and being able to adjust to them, the starting point is being present to who they are. So that, of course, begs the question, how are you present to who they are? The first thing to be thinking about is whether they are emotion or logic. When you think about your interactions with different people, Think about how you recognize that. Emotion people are about the, the stories and the emotions and the feelings and the experiences. And the logic people are very practical and analytical and they want to talk about the tasks and the very specific logistical components of it. They're both correct. There isn't a right or wrong for this. It's what is it for them? Now, please note, we all use both emotion and logic. It's different at different times. Sometimes it's circumstantial what's going on. Sometimes it's even the, simply the topic. We also have a default where we go most of the time. The key to this is recognizing which one someone is using in that particular moment. And if it changes, recognizing that it changed. And that way you're prepared to adjust and shift with them. Another element to really being present to who they are is recognizing whether they are passive or aggressive. We all have a primary tendency of one or the other. If we're primarily passive, we think inside of our heads silently. If we're primarily aggressive, we think out loud and we express that. In either case, it's important that we simply hold space. Hold the silence for someone to think silently. Hold the space for someone to think out loud. Let them express it. Passive people will be slower 
to make a decision. Aggressive people will do it quickly. Again, what is it that works for them? We recognize it and then we adjust to them based on what it is. When we combine these elements, we have what we call different personal styles. And so the way we have the conversation around these personal styles, yes, I know we don't like labels or putting people in a box. And now I'm gonna start labeling and putting people in a box. We don't stay in one box. We move around between the boxes. This is a way to process, to think about it, to have a conversation and for you to notice what it is for someone and then adjust to them in that moment. So in terms of people, we mentioned passive and aggressive. Statistically, 70% of us are primarily passive and 30% of us are primarily aggressive. In terms of emotion and logic, we're evenly split. 50% of us are primarily emotion, 50% are primarily logic. When we start combining these two, then we have different personal styles. So if we say emotion and passive, one way we define that person is they're a pleaser. They really want everyone to be happy. They want everyone to get along. They want to take care of people. This is the person that often becomes the go-to. If there's something you're looking for or need, you go to them because they either have it or they're find it or take care of it. If you have someone that is emotion and aggressive, one way of describing this person is celebrator. Who's the celebrator? They like to have fun. They're happy, they're optimistic, they're creative, they think outside the box, they're very full of energy. They have a great sense of humor, life of the party, if you will. If you have someone who is aggressive and logic, we identify that person as an achiever. I think type A, you've probably heard that. This is the person who wants to get it done. They want to make things happen. And they're very focused on that. They're fast paced and very much self-directed. If someone is passive and logic, we call them an investigator. The investigator is the person who wants to research. They want to analyze. They want to think about it. They want to make sure they do it right. So when we consider different personal styles, here's what's important to know. If someone is functioning in an emotion place and you start a conversation with them, it's very important to them that you check in. How are you doing? How was your weekend? How are the kids? How's the dog? Whatever else is going on and have that personal conversation because to them without it, you don't have a good relationship. Alternatively, if someone is logic, our investigators and achievers, they much prefer to get to the point, focus on the task, what it is, what we're here to do. If there's time later, we can talk about the emotion or the people side of things. They want to start with a task focus. Whatever it is for them, when you identify and adjust to it, they're more comfortable. And it's far easier to work with them based on who they are. Similarly, your passive people prefer time. They prefer silence to be able to think and process. Your aggressive people want to think out loud and they want to decide fairly quickly. Flex to what works for that person. There's an additional element. On top of the personal styles, we also have different learning styles. The most common ones that we talk about are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. We've recognized these for years and years. So here's what is helpful for you. Pay attention to what people say. The words they use are often indicative of their learning style. So if we break it down, think about visual related to what people see connected to their eyes. The eyes are up higher. For auditory people, think about what they hear and connect it to the ears, which are down a little bit lower. For kinesthetic people, think about feeling and experiencing, doing their being and connected to the heart and that's down lower. In terms of the words they use, 
they're descriptive based on their learning style. That means somebody who is visual will say things like, I'm drawing a blank. It's clear to me. Let's focus on this. I have a different perspective. I've got a vision. It appears to me. I'm getting a glimpse. Look at this. I want to show you something. Oh, you're a sight for sore eyes. In each of those phrases, there's a word that pertains to what somebody sees. If someone is auditory, the words they use will be about what they hear in a conversation. I want to say something. Let's discuss that. That resonates. I have a question. I want to tell you something. Did you hear that? Let me repeat it word for word. Hey, tune into this. Oh, they're so vocal. In each of these examples, the words pertain to what somebody is hearing. If somebody is kinesthetic, their language is about feeling and experiencing, which means they'll say things like, I feel where you're coming from. This is so exciting. Do you grasp the potential here? I want to touch that. Let's reshape this. I'm going to drive this forward. We're on solid ground. I'm very calm. I'm sensing movement. In each of these cases, the person is using language that pertains to their feelings and experiences. So we identify their personal style based on logic or emotion, passive or aggressive. And we also want to recognize their learning style. To give you examples of how you adjust to someone's learning style, Think about the way we ask questions. If somebody is visual, you'll ask things like, paint a picture, describe what you see, or very simply, what does it look like? If somebody is auditory and you're asking questions, use auditory words about what they hear. For example, what are you saying to yourself? What are sounds around you? What are key words to describe it? If someone is kinesthetic, use language about what they feel, do, or experience. So you may ask, how do you feel? What does it mean to you? Or how does it affect you? The more you recognize different personal styles and then adjust to them, the more effective you are. So when we talk about emotion, logic, passive aggressive, the examples we gave there, in terms of visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, it's interesting to note, 40% are primarily visual, 20% are primarily auditory, 40% primarily kinesthetic. We are a combination, we all use all three. If you really wanna motivate someone, adjust to logic and emotion, adjust to passive and aggressive, adjust to learning style. And as you're asking them to describe their desired outcome, ask them to describe it using all three languages with the key being that you do it in their order of preference. So if somebody's auditory, start with questions there. If they're kinesthetic, start there. If they're visual, start there. Then go to their second preference, then their third. The idea of having them use all three is that the fuller the description is, the more real it is to them and the more motivated they are to move toward that. So that's a couple of very important keys if you want to motivate, follow through. Now let's build on that. Think about the questions you ask. And the way you ask your questions makes a difference. Every word changes the meaning. One of the favorite examples I usually use is this one. One of our coaches was facilitating a board retreat for an international organization. And the question was posed, how can we be the best of the world? 
and the conversation began. And then somebody said, change the question. Instead of how can we be the best of the world, change it to how can we be the best for the world? You're talking OF to FOR, and it completely changes the focus of that question and the conversation that followed. Every word we use counts. Sometimes the mistake people make is using too many words because then it gets confusing. So in terms of questions, we really want to think about how we're doing that. First off, speaking to the power of questions. Perhaps you're familiar with having someone do the telling. And the more they're telling, the less people are listening. One of our first tenets is to stop telling. It's not working anyway. People aren't really listening. They're not really processing. They're not going to follow through and do it. Instead, start asking. Because when you ask questions, they're brain linkage. If I ask you a question, what happens? When I'm asking you a question, are you thinking? Is that happening whether or not you're answering? Think about what you're experiencing right now with those questions. It gets your brain going. We definitely want to be asking questions. The focus of the questions really matters. Very specifically, there is a tendency to focus on the problem, to ask about who said it, who did it, what went wrong, whose fault is it, and it just deteriorates from there. So a very important tenet is to stop focusing on the problem. Whatever happened, happened, and we're not going to change history. And instead, what we want to do is start focusing on solutions. Wherever we're at, we're there. From this point, where do we want to go and how do we want to get there? When you formulate questions, there are a couple of key components. First off, you've heard the acronym KISS, different variations on it. The variation we're going to use here is called keep it short and simple. The shorter your question and the simpler your question, the more powerful your question. And, and people struggle with that. They think, really? There's a lack of profound language and all of that kind of thing. The reality is for the person you're asking, the shorter the question, the simpler the question, the easier for them to understand and process it and continue in their flow of thought. So instead of interrupting their thinking, you're going with their thinking. Short, simple questions are powerful. It's very important that questions have a forward focus. Instead of talking about the past or the problem, the questions are about the future, the desired outcome. What is it that people want? And when you focus your questions in this way, it totally changes the dynamic of both the thinking actually and the conversation. It's very interesting how often when you ask a question, the client or the individual answers the question and within their answer is the next question. This does require that you're listening deeply. You're actually paying attention to what they're saying. And that answer will lead you to the next question. In coaching, one of the things we know is that better than 90% of our questions start with one of two words. We either ask what or we ask how. Now, sometimes people want to get fancy. Well, occasionally who, when, where fits in. What and how are how we set up, of course, having the open-ended question that really makes it possible for that person to engage, to explore, et cetera. If our question is closed, then it's a yes or no answer, and it's harder for them to really do the thinking and expand their thinking. So as a hint for you, if your question starts with, the words is, or any, or can, or do, or will, those are all closed questions. And chances are you're leading them. So then you're back to telling instead of asking. Stick with what and how. 
in addition to how we ask our questions being incredibly significant. We mentioned that forward focus. Let's talk about that and a few other insights that are incredibly important. When you're talking with someone, there's a difference between talking about what they're moving toward, where they're running to, versus what they're running away from. If somebody is talking about what they're getting away from, I don't want such a mean boss. I don't want a long commute. I don't want to weigh so much. I don't want this, that, or the other thing. It's really tough to move forward because they don't know where they're going. My favorite example for this, some of you have heard it, is imagine you are a travel agent and I come into your office and I say, okay, book me a vacation. And you say, sure, where do you want to go? And I say, well, I don't want to go to the desert and I don't want to go to snow and I don't want to go here and I don't want to go there. And I tell you everything I don't want. Can you possibly book my vacation? No, because you don't know where to buy the ticket to. The same is true when we're talking with other people. When we focus about where we want to go to, we're going to be productive and move forward. Ask them very specifically what they do want. If they tell you what they don't want, say, okay, if you don't want that, what do you want instead? And keep it focused there. Another important factor is the source of motivation. Some people are internally motivated. Some people are externally motivated. So how do you know? If someone is externally motivated, it means they're doing something for someone else or to avoid a consequence. And it will have a short-term impact. Short-term in as far as how long that motivation will last. When someone is internally motivated, they're doing it for themselves, for what it means for them. And that will lead to long-term meaningful change. Very important that when you're having a conversation with somebody, you talk about what they do want. A third element is the difference between being proactive and being reactive. Initiating action versus waiting. If someone's reactive, they're literally waiting for someone else to do something for something else to happen. And they take no initiative or control over any of it. If someone is proactive, they are doing what is possible for them to do within their control to move it in the direction they desire. You've heard of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and he talks about being proactive. What can you do to move it forward? Your key with these three is to remember the word tip. Very specifically, ask people what they're moving toward, their internal motivation, and how they're proactively moving forward. When you put these things together, you start to really empower ownership. So you recognize who they are. You adjust to their personal style. You adjust to their learning style. You ask these powerful questions. And ultimately, when somebody defines their own plan, they own it and they follow through. So what does that mean your focus is? For empowering ownership, you want to recognize and adjust to them. Ask the powerful questions. Focus on what they're moving toward, their internal motivation, and their proactive planning. Have them define the end objective, the strategies, the action steps to move forward. They own it. That's where you get the follow through. A quick peek at some resources for you. First off, Center for Coaching Certification and Coach123. So who are these organizations? The Center for Coaching Certification provides coach training from entry-level basics all the way through supporting your credentialing at the ACC or PCC level. Coach123 provides coaches inside organizations. In addition to that, is also available for team coaching and group coaching. 
and of course, to support coaching programs inside of organizations. Lots of sources of additional information. There's a blog uh, via the website. There are also a series of books called Coaching Perspectives that are published with chapters written by graduates of the coach training programs. And then of course, the free webinars like this. If you are interested in a quick check, whether you're continuing your own coaching education or you wanna talk about getting a coach or getting coaches in an organization, definitely available for you. Uh, just quick phone call or email, we'll set things up to support you. Yes, the outsourcing is there for coaching programs, training and coaching. In terms of you now, if you do have questions about coach training or coaching programs, coaching support, let me know. We'll schedule a 30-minute call. There isn't any kind of commitment or obligation. It's exploratory. For those of you who are here exploring for yourself and continuing your own education, do reflect on the insights from today. Intentionally plan for yourself. Engage a coach and develop your support network. I am happy to hang around afterwards for questions and answers. In the meantime, what I do want to do is thank all of you for being here, for your time and participation. What's going to happen next is we will complete uh, this recorded portion of the program. I'm going to end the recording. We're going to move into a live discussion after the recording's over. So hang tight, everybody. For those of you listening to the recording, thank you very much for being here. And do come visit us. Uh, the websites are www.coach-123.com and www.coachcert.com. Make it a great one.